guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, I just want to say thanks for all the feedback and comments over the last month. It means a lot to me that people are actually learning stuff, you know, getting back involved with Gene Steeler Corps, taking their stuff off the shelves and getting involved with the faction again. Now, 9th edition is about a year old now and it hasn't been kind to us so far, but as always, we're the true underdogs of 40k and I really respect the sort of players who, you know, they stick to, stick to their guns instead of just jumping shit when the next big thing comes along. Now, we haven't had any indication of a new codex yet. There was that little teaser with the Acolyte's hand and the Detonator, but that amounted to nothing. So, you know, I guess we're just used to being neglected now. But anyway, this episode, I'm going to be spending some time focusing on the big boy of Gene Steel Cult, which is the granddaddy Patriarch himself. Now, I'm going to say this plain and simple. If you play this faction and you don't feel the Patriarch, then I think you're an Egypt. Now, before we get on to the beef and cheese of the topic, I'll just show a quick view of my own Patriarch, which is here. Um, he's actually the second one that I made and painted. I got my first one really early on when I started collecting them and I just misposed the arms in the wrong sockets, which is this one. And I don't know, I didn't paint him as well as I could have done. So the second time around, you know, I really wanted to up the quality. I went for a classic Xenomorph, slick black body with mag uh, magenta undertones. I'll say now that if you're starting to or want to collect cool, this model is so fucking cool to do. He just, you know, he looks so mean. But if you want, you know, a bit of variety, you can also get the classic Tyranid Broodlord, which I haven't really painted yet. I don't like the base on this one, and I just don't think I'm going to get around to it. But then there's also like a Space Hulk one, which you can get, which comes on the kind of throne of schools. And there's also custom ones you can get, like this one I got off eBay. We, you know, he's on the classic throne thing. The throne is a throwback to, I think, first or second edition Rogue Trader, where Gene Steeler Patriot was this massive, grotesque ball sack looking thing which is just hilarious but you know if you like your novelty you know old school stuff then you can still get them on ebay now whenever i start a game against a friend or someone i've played before online there's always a moment where you know they see the patriarch being set up and they just go oh fuck not him again and i think that kind of fearsome reputation is really well deserved because the patriarch is an absolute top tier character and rightly so since you know the entire faction is based around his very existence in my eyes, however, his strength is that he's not actually too overbearing. You know, in truth, he's actually relatively cheap at 135 points. And, you know, I consider that to be an absolute steal. But, you know, I always spend the extra 15 points each for two familiars, so that brings him into 165. Now, the fact that he's actually a relatively small investment gives you so much more room to fit in, you know, all the extra infantry and stuff. Like, you know, the Tyranids, they get the Swarm Lord. I think he's actually come down in points now to 240, but he used to be 270, which is a big chunk. Now, I remember watching a video, you know, a long time ago that stated that the Patriarch is the Broodlord the Tyranids wish they could have. And that is so true. You know, on paper, they're really similar, but, you know, the cult's unique faction abilities and their combinations of relics and warlord traits just make him so much better. Most Tyranid players will probably agree that their codex traits and relics are just absolute dog shit in terms of what the Broodlord can be given and actually most of their other stuff too. Now, in the old days of 8th edition, you know, where people could run two or three detachments of standards called, you know, you'd get loads of CP, you could just see an equal number of Patriarchs each leading a battalion. But these days, it's a minimum of two CP just to get another patrol for one. So, you know, you've got to remember there's the gene set rule, which means you can only have one of each character in a detachment. So that's only one Patriarch, one Magus, one Primus, whatever. So, you know, that sucks. As a faction, though, we're super hungry for CP by design. So... You really want to be avoiding bringing in another detachment just for, you know, getting that extra Patriarch or something. You know, we go through fucking CP faster than a squig on crack. But, you know, one of the key issues with only having one Patriarch on the board is that if you lose him early on, you know, it can be a real kick in the tits. And I'm not sure if other cool players feel the same, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, the Patriarch is like the living embodiment of my command on the board. And, you know, as much as I want to keep him alive, I tend to be also quite balls out of the bath as a player and I cannot resist the temptation to get him into a fight, you know, get stuck in. I love fighting with him and I want him to get all the glory. I mean, really, I should have collected orcs because I play like an orc. But, you know, it does often get me in a precarious situation where, you know, I'm calling my pants down after a brawl and then suddenly I'm like, oh, I'm in save the patriarch mode. And then, you know, a counter offensive will come in and I'm shit my pants. So I'm learning to curb that urge and, you know, just kind of reserve him a bit. So the issue is, if you pay good points for a key model, in my mind, I'm thinking that I want to be getting the most out of him from turn one. You know, sometimes you've really got to keep the reins on yourself, you know, keep him pulled back a bit and then wait for that, you know, key moment where, you know, turn two, three, whatever, and then you can finally spring out, you know, the gloves come off and then, you know, it's time to rock and roll. But anyway, I'm shit-chatting. 
So back to the beginning, what makes the Patriarch so good? Now, first off, he's fast. You know, like a standard gene stealer, he can move eight inches plus an advance and he can always charge. And let me just say now that, especially if you're playing a small game, like 500 or 1,000 points on an incursion sized table, that makes him lethal, you know? He can really just traverse distances that just, you know, dominate that sort of space. Now, he may not be able to benefit from a cult creed, and I'll say this for the hundredth time, you know, Gene Steelers and the Patriot can't get the cult creed, but he can still get buffs to his advance, you know, from Clamavus nearby, for example. Anyway, the true genius factor of the Patriot lies in his keywords. He's not a monster, he's an infantry character. That means he can leap through terrain despite his size. Even better, he can ride in a transport. So when deploying, I often start him in a Goliath truck, you know, so I can combine my sneaky forward advancement tricks with his own movement for a huge reach turn one if I want. Now, if you haven't seen what I mean by this Goliath truck trick, check out my other videos because I did one about cool ambush and deployment where I explain it all. But in short, it's using the red blip to, you know, pop up outside of your deployment zone with a the truck. Then, you know, the patriarch or whoever gets out, then he advances and charges, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, people still seem to think that this is against the rules, but, you know, it's totally legal and it's awesome. So do it. It's like the one thing that we've got that helps us do good stuff. Who needs a swarm lord? Now, of course, like anything else in the Codex, he can deep strike, but that is such a huge waste of his potential psychic ability and everything else turn one. You know, his speed, his morale bubble. Don't do it. Never, you know, don't deep strike the Patriarch. Trust me on this, I used to do it a lot and I learned the hard way. Now, I mentioned his psychic abilities, so let's look at that. He's a great psyker. Gene Steelcourt got some critical powers that I can't imagine living without. And, you know, assuming you take some familiars with you, you can have the ability to cast two per turn. Now, I admit, I got this wrong in a previous video, I think. So, the way they actually worked, and you know, if you reread the wording, what I've realised is, having familiars does not just give you two casts full stop. So instead, a single familiar can grant you a single extra cast once per game. So from what I understand, if you have two familiars, that means at two points throughout the game, you'll have an extra cast. So, you know, in short, once a familiar has done that, he's then used, he's expended. So as a forward, I'd say, don't waste one of those extra casts on something you can do without early on in the game, because, you know, turn three or something, you could really need something that's critical and then you're gonna be just fucked. Now, one thing I'm not 100% sure on is that having two familiars means that you could both lend their additional power in the same phase. And I just went back to reread the rule, and I have to be honest, I think it does allow for that. So you could have your two Broodmind, and then you could cast a Smite if you so wanted, but then they'll both be expended. Um, but anyway, you know, personally, I think they should just make it really simple. You know, just have two familiars gives you extra casts. But, you know, that's something for the new codex if and whenever it comes. Now, I wouldn't recommend it on the Patriarch, but you can exchange one of these familiars for the Crouchling Relic. You know, that gives you a second cast permanently, and it also gives you plus one to your casting roll. Personally, I think this is for Omegas, you know. She is a, de or he is a dedicated Psyker, whereas the Patriarch has got much better relics to just, you know, do a million other things, like combat purposes, you know. I'm gonna pull myself up here. I also made a mistake in my Cult Ambush video where I claimed that a stratagem called the Cult Psyche could be used on Omegas, give plus one to cast also to a nearby patriarch and i totally misread that and had been doing for ages so my bad so cult psych simply just allows a magus to get an additional plus one to cast when another psyker such as another magus or a patriarch is next to them so if you you know group all of your psychers together then that magus will get another plus one or another plus two if there's two psychers now when it comes down to choosing your powers a smite may seem tempting you know you get some direct damage output but you know there's so much other cool stuff you can do here Assuming you'll be fielding Omegas too, you'll have around four or five powers to pick in total, and the critical one should go on Omegas, you know, that's her job. For example, Might From Beyond, Mass Hypnosis, Psychic Stimulus, you know, I always take those three, and then maybe make use of the Crouchling or Cool Psych to make, you know, make double sure that they're going to go off. But that leaves me with secondary casts, like Mental Onslaught, Mind Control, or Mutagenic Deviation, which, you know, I might put on the Patriarch. They're all what I call Sinner bonus stuff, you know, if they go off, it's great, but if they don't, you know, my game plan won't rely on them and I'm not fucked. But anyway, so Mental Onslaught especially is something I'd always stick on the Patriarch because it relies on his leadership base, which is 10. So that increases your chances of it working out. So the way it works, um, you roll a dice and then you add your leadership to the result. So if you're starting at 10 and you roll three, that's 13. So then you get the opponent to do that with the, you know, their thing that you're doing it against. So let's say it's a tank and it's got a leadership seven and they roll a three then they are at 10. So therefore you beat them, you get a mortal wound, and then you go again. If they roll a six, it automatically ends, and you know, 
if you just keep winning, then it dies. It's simple as that. Now, they did FAQ this power a long, long time ago, but before that, you could line up, you know, a load of silly buffs like, you know, plus one and minus one leadership abilities, and you could essentially create a scenario where this psychic power could take down a knight in one go or anything without even needing to roll because it was just mathematically impossible for the enemy to beat the total that you were going to even start with plus your roll. But then they made it so, you know, the six automatically cancels it out. But I still use this and it still does really come off in some great situations and people are just like, fuck, you know, what the hell has just happened? Now, they may help out with Psychic a lot, but there's a second key reason to take Familiars and it can really save your bacon in a pinch. Uh, this is another thing that I've been getting wrong for quite a while when I started. In the past, I used to make, you know, keep things simple by just assuming that a Familiar was like an extra wound for the Patriarch. So if you had six wounds plus two Familiars, that made eight. And it was simple as that to me. But I was really selling it short by doing that because you've got to think of them as like mini bodyguards or drones or something. Let's say your Patriarch gets targeted by a LAS cannon or something which does ridiculous damage, you know, D3 plus 3, whatever. If he gets hit and he gets wounded and he fails his armor save, that damage can go through to the Familiar instead of him, you know. They could sink six damage into a pointless little gribbly monster thing. In a way, you've got to think it like, you know, a hidden little trick along the same lines as unquestioning loyalty, but built into the Patriarch data sheet instead. The thing is, you know, they're independent of that rule. So it's like having two, which you can layer on top and just keep that trick in your back pocket. But anyway, I've kind of de deviated there, but you know, I think it's important to outline why taking Famous is so important. Never leave home without them. But anyway, uh, let's go back to the big boy himself and focus on his damage. Now, he may not have any ballistic weapons, obviously, but immediately he can rip shit up. At base six attacks, each monstrous rending claw, you know, will be hitting on twos, re-rolling all failed wounds, starting at strength six. So granted a base, he's not ideally suited for damaging something that's really tough, seven or eight, but there's ways around it. Now, you know, the real overkill comes with the AP on the claws, which starts at minus three, but on wound rolls of six plus, it goes up to a ridiculous minus six AP, I think. So as with Aberrants, be aware that his effectiveness is drastically blunted by high inborn enemies so six attacks is plenty but you know if you miss one or two and then maybe one fails to wound even with a reroll six attacks you know it can easily end up as only two or three getting through and then there's the save you know they might get lucky and then you just you know stuck pants down now the normal damage per hit is d3 which isn't great because that can be swinging but on those wound rolls of six plus it also gets bumped up to flat three which is great but, you know, you got to note there's combos to be had which allow you to easily trigger those super attacks of, you know, flat damage and super AP. Because, you know, for example, you can do mutagenic deviation onto the enemy that you're fighting. And then on a 5+, plus, you know, you could be getting these things. And, you know, in the old days, it wasn't limited. I think in 8th, you could do other tricks in the special detachments you get. So he could be doing these on a 4+, plus, you know, or even a 3+, plus. I can't remember now. This is a great way to deal with things like, you know, Terminators, Custodies, anything with 3 wounds, you know, you can just kill outright if you get lucky. Now, one other thing that I've noticed is that due to the fact that he re-rolls all his failed wounds, you actually often benefit. If you're hitting something that's higher toughness, let's say you fail half of your wound rolls, you know, then you roll them again and it just gives you more chance of actually getting, you know, the super claw hits. Now, the issue with D3 damage is that, you know, if you come up against your average two wound models, let's say primary space marines, whatever, you know, you can run into problems fairly easily when you get all the hits and the wounds through, but then you get a bunch of ones on your damage roll because then everything just starts to, you know, all the damage just comes down. You put one damage into the first guy, then you could have a three damage one coming in next, but it doesn't matter because it only kills the first guy, you know, and then it just ends up as this situation where you really not, you don't do as much damage as you thought you were going to. So at this point, I would recommend Bioalchemist, which is the Twisted Helix. Everyone knows I love Twisted Helix special um, warlord trait. So it adds plus one damage to his attacks, which means that all of those claws are D3 plus one. So if you roll a one, it's still plus one, you still get a minimum of two. So if you're attacking Marines, you can't not kill a Marine, you know, that has to happen. So there's also things like, you know, if you're coming up against Death Guard, you would have to get a three to kill one of those Marines because it reduces it by two. You know, a play Marine will just make a roll of one or two becomes one. So that really sucks. Also, if you get a you know a wound roll of six, then you'll be doing four flat damage. Four flat damage is insane. Anyway, getting a bit distracted. So where was I? Um, let's look at him on the board and how you generally play him. So due to his speed, his menacing combat profile, it can be very tempting to rush into a scrap early in the game. 
it's a trap I've fallen into many times. I said before, if you're paying the points, you want to be getting a return on him, you know, in every battle round just to maximize your damage, right? But on the other hand, his presence has so many other factors that boost your army. So losing out on them can really mess stuff up. You know, for example, his aura of uh, auto passing morale is just priceless. You've got guys who are going to be pushing up the board with him and it just helps to know that as long as you keep them, you know, just in that six inches, they're just not going to run away no matter what happens to them. But, um, you know, let me tell you this, the enemy will come for him and you're going to need those meat shields. You, know, you need those guys around him because, you know, he's going to take wounds and they need to jump in the way using questioning loyalty. So I'll say next, try to think one turn ahead. It like pays to just always be careful and double think what you're exposing him to. Because, I mean, this goes for any character, obviously. But if you rush into a melee fight, keep it in the back of your mind that next turn, you know, you could be up there at the front, you got in a fight, and then the enemy could just fall back, and then suddenly they're just going to unleash a load of shooting at him with the rest of their army. So, again, you've got to keep a focus on positioning. Think a few steps ahead. Try and keep the near fight hybrids around him always within three inches and just, if possible, maybe a little bit ahead of his position so they can't even target him, you know, well, not easily anyway. But, um, you know, think to yourself, if I push up and make some charges, where is he going to be by the end of the turn? You know, one critical mistake that I often make is that I advance my meat shields, my hybrids, up the board by his side, but then I forget that if the Patriot makes a charge, you know, these guys are going to be left in the dust and out of the three-inch range for unquestioning loyalty. So this is what I'm talking about when you end up too far ahead of the support gang and suddenly you're stuck in a counter-offensive, he just hasn't got those people around to support him. One thing I could recommend is use the familiars to your advantage because they can trail back, you know, if he charges forwards, they stay back and then you can still link up to the guys behind, you know, up to maybe six inches there and, you know, then you've saved yourself, potentially. So let's talk about durability next because I've already glossed over this at the start of the video where, I'm, you know, I'm talking about familiars. But I'd like to focus a bit more in depth on it because he is weirdly survival if you play your cards right. So the first stop of increasing durability is always the Icon Ward. You know, if you've got him around, I feel no pain of six is a long shot, but it will save you on those days where, you know, you just need a miracle when it comes through. Um, the Icon Ward is cheap. It's just a great body to keep in the middle of that big mass of guys who are also around the Patriarch. So when they're trying to kill, you know, the bodyguards off, they're also going to be, you know, slightly more durable. On the surface, a base toughness of five from is nothing to write home about, I admit that. Granted, it does mean that standard small arms fire, stuff like, you know, bolt guns, they will be wounded on a five plus. So it's, they're going to struggle. But, you know, if the enemy gets a chance to fight you with the big guns, they won't waste a second. And rightly so. You know, the real threat to him is middle of the road stuff like heavy bolters, auto cannons, anything which has got a fairly high volume of shots with low AP and flat damage, it just really causes a problem for him because it will also chew through all your bodyguards just as easily as you know one singular big shot. Now, if you kit him out with the amulet of the boardroom, your standard save against ballistics fire will be three plus. So if you get him in cover, you know, he could be on a two plus. That ain't half bad. But it's not even the main reason I take it. This relic gives you like the ability to ignore Overwatch. That means if you charge in multiple squads, your Patriarch can go first, connect with the enemy, shut down their Overwatch, and then you bring in the Acolytes and stuff, and then they're the real damage dealers. Normally, you know, you'd be turning off Overwatch with one of the best psychic powers, which is mass hypnosis. But remember, that can be denied. Um, one thing about this as well, the fighting uh, first, last and middle rules have changed. So read up on that because now mass hypnosis is a lot stronger. It stops people from, you know, just coming in with a 2CP counteroffensive unless they've got other rules which can conflict with it. You know, Overwatch may not be a huge thing anymore, but it's important to respect it. You know, if you want to charge some nasty gunline stuff, it can just really blunt your chances. And as a pointer, people have debated that the amulet does not infect your inborn save. And I'd like to ensure that it definitely does. It affects saving throws, not armor saving throws. So that does include inborns. Um, one alternative thing to consider is the relic, the elixir of the prime specimen, which will be upping his toughness to six. It gives you an extra wound, I think, as well, and an extra attack, I believe. Um, you know, this does make a difference, but only really when getting hit by something which is strength three or five. It won't make a difference to the other stuff. You know, it's a great relic, but it's not my first pick. Um, the honourable mention would also go to the other trait, Shadow Stalker, which is a minus one to hit. Simple, effective way just to keep him alive a bit. I take this occasionally, and whilst it's nice, you know, it never really stands out to me as amazing. You know, there's other ways to make it more durable. Um, there's one called Born Survivor 2, but honestly, I'd never take it. It reduces damage taken by one. Yeah, we already have many ways of pulling off multi-damage hits via unquestioned loyalty and the familiars. As I mentioned, they don't tend to be the real worry for him. You know, he tends to get killed by lots of damage one hit. So the Born Survivor trait ain't going to help you there, really. 
Bottom line is, I think your choices basically come down to this. Angle at the boardroom or elixir of the prime specimen. Don't go bladed cog and choose mark of the claw on the side. That is stupid. And don't put the crouching on him. Give that to the magus. Warlord traits, biomorph adaption for more um, strength and attacks. And I'd say probably by alchemist actually. That's my pick anyway. Now the last bit of my video cut off yesterday. So I'm going to finish it up here. So there's one other rule to check out. It's not really a biggie, but if you run uh, pure strain gene stealers, which I never do because they're crap and they're overpriced, if for some reason you do, you know, your patriot will be giving them plus one to hit rolls when nearby. So they'll be hitting on two plus, which is okay, fair enough, good. Um, if they were the same price as the classic Tyranid um, gene stealers, or if they could benefit from creeds, or if they were troops for objective secured, then, you know, fair enough, people will be using them. But, um, you know, they're not, so don't use them. So, yeah, that pretty much wraps up everything. Let's go back and summarise. So, you know, how the hell do you make the best use out of him? One, always deploy him with disposable minions, very close. Don't ever, you know, leave his side. He should be in the middle of a big infantry blob, you know, for protection reasons, and also for his auto-passer morale. Two, resist the temptation to get into combat early on. You know, despite all of his defensive shenanigans, he can still go down really quickly. So, you know, your enemy can get lucky with that. Number three, I'd say pick between Biomorph Adaption or um, Bio Alchemist for your traits. Um, you know, that plus one damage is just, it's great for everything. Combine that with the Relic Amulet of the Void Rim. So, you know, you can repeatedly use him to shut down Overwatch. You don't have to ever worry about that. And also he gets a 4 plus invulnerable save to shooting only. Um, don't use the Mark of the Claudum, so for God's sake, that is for an Abominant. Number four, always take extra familiars, you know, for added wounds and for the psychic stuff. Remember to use them for the damage mitigation stuff against high-powered shots. Number five, use Mental Onslaught to snipe enemy characters and make their heads explode and stuff. You know, if you get the Magus nearby with the Inspiring Warlord trait, that's from the Core Codex um, Warlord traits, then he gets or she gets plus one to their leadership for nearby people. And then you could get the Clamorverse for plus one as well. You'd be starting on a base of 12 with the Patriarch, you know, that's great. Um, six, avoid throwing him into combat with anything that has got a good invulnerable save because, well, I mean, if you can help it, they really do stop his effectiveness. Seven, watch out for high volume of fire attacks. He's generally safe against high damage single shot weapons. Punisher cannons, for example, there is Nemesis. You know, shitty pants then. Eight, if all goes to shit, keep him alive with the one CP stratagem, hypermetabolism, to get some wounds back. You know, that can keep him alive. And then lastly, rule number nine. This is the most important one. Have fun with him. He's the centerpiece of your army. He's there to be used. If you want to just have a psychic buffing character, you know, who sits at the back, then just take the Magus and be a pussy with them instead. The Patriarch exists to be the epicenter of your army, not just visually, but tactically. As long as you time it right, you can stick the boot in and you can still come away unscathed and, you know, go another round. So, yeah, hopefully this video has given you some nice ideas to try out. Like I said, go back and watch my video on unquestioning loyalty, because if you don't understand that, it's critical to the Patriarch's, you know, survival and everything. Um, and yeah, and that's all. So thanks for watching, guys. See you soon.